five nights at Freddy's. Fazbear writes, Number eight, story two, Sergio's lucky day. Sergio looked up from his drafting board and squinted in annoyance at the bright sunshine blasting through the wall-to-wall windows along the front of the office building. He shifted to avoid being blinded, and he rubbed at the afternoon kink in his neck. He checked the time on his new stainless steel aviator-style watch, 2.32 p.m. He peered at the subdials within the main dial of the watch. His watch had three subdials, and he had no use for any of them, but they looked impressive. And things that looked impressive made him feel impressive. Above all, that was what Sergio wanted to be. Impressive. I keep telling you, you have to be careful what you wish for, Serg. Sergio jerked toward the man who'd come up behind him, and he knocked over his coffee mug in the process. It went flying, but the man, Dale, Sergio's supervisor, caught it. Dale was a senior manager in the architectural firm and a big guy, an ex-football player to boot. The mug looked puny in his massive hand. Now you've gone and done it, Dale said, flicking a few drops of coffee from his wrist. Thankfully, there wasn't much left in the mug. The sun hit the top of Dale's shaved head, and it shined so bright it looked like a halo. Sorry, Dale. Didn't mean to throw a mug at you. What? Dale looked down at the mug, then thrust it back at Sergio. Look at the mug. You got it, Serg. You got the project manager job. Sergio stood, then grinned. Really? I thought the decision wasn't going to be made until next week. It got pushed up because Sanders is leaving sooner than we thought he was. Sergio slid his shiny black wingtips over the gray carpet in an abbreviated moonwalk back toward the sunshine behind him. Then he twirled and did a fist pump. Dale chuckled. Congratulations! He held out his hand. Sergio shook his hand, but then he frowned. What did you mean by what you said? What did I say? Well, you said two things. Be careful what you wish for, and now you've gone and done it. Well, you do realize how hard project managers work, right? Are you ready to start living at the office? Sergio laughed. Dale didn't. Sergio sobered. Are you serious? Dale grinned and punched Sergio's arm. Only a little. We'll probably only have to sleep here three or four nights a month. Sergio nodded as if that was just fine, but it really wasn't. The truth was that when he applied for the project manager job, he hadn't really been thinking about what the job would be like. He applied because it was the next logical step up from where he was. He was on a fast track to the top, and staying on that track meant applying for promotions, whether he wanted to do more work or not. At 27, he defied the laws of becoming an architect to get to where he already was. He got through the college and post-grad work needed by the time he was 21. He was hired by the best architectural firm in town, and he had his license by the time he was 21. He was hired by the best architectural firm in town, and had his license by the time he was 22. It only took him three years to get a senior architect, much to the annoyance of several older architects who got passed over. And now he was the firm's youngest ever project manager. Why was he able to do all of this? Well, one, he was an architectural phenom. Ever since he was a kid, he had a head for numbers and an eye for spatial relationships. He knew how to mold physical reality into something eye-catching. And two, he was determined. He was so determined to reach the top that he willed himself to work as hard as he had to. Nothing would stop him from getting what he wanted. But lately, he began to wonder whether what he wanted was really what he wanted. Earth to Serg, Dale said. Lost you there. Sergio shook his head. 
Sorry. Don't worry, Dale said. We won't make you sleep here tonight. Dale let loose with one of his four lofts, which was just one step below a sonic boom. Sergio noticed that not a single head on the design floor lifted at the sound. Everyone was used to it. Dale tapped Sergio's drafting desk. I'll let you get back to it. But after work, we should go out for dinner to celebrate your promotion. Say, 7.30? Oh, and you'll need to pack up your stuff. I'll have Janitorial bring you boxes. They'll be moving your things into your office tomorrow. Sergio smiled. That was another reason he'd apply for the project manager job. He was going to get his own office, an enclosed space. No more working out here in the open with the other junior and senior architects. Now, that was impressive. As soon as Dale strode away, Sergio's closest work buddy, both in terms of desk location and time spent together, Clive, threw a up piece of paper at him. Congrats, you idiot! Sergio deflected the ball of paper and said, You're just jealous. Not even a little, idiot. Clive shook his round head, and his bushy brown hair fell into his eyes. For at least the thousandth time, Sergio marveled at how much his friend looked like Bubbles, the chocolate labradoodle, Clive, and his girlfriend, Fiona, another architect in the firm, doted on. It wasn't just Clive's brown curly hair. It was his big brown eyes, the earthy tones he dressed in, and the fluid way he moved, always ready for some kind of fun. Once, Sergio told Clive that he looked like Bubbles, and Clive responded with, Yeah, well you look like Trotter. Sergio had to laugh at that. Trotter was Dale's dog, a spoiled miniature pincher, and Sergio actually could see the resemblance. Like Trotter, he was small and compact and slender, and he had a somewhat pointed nose. Also like Trotter, though, he was muscular and sleek. He wore his black hair slicked back, and he always dressed in dark, fitted clothing. He knew he wasn't good-looking, but he did his best to have his own impressive, of course, style. And his girlfriend, Violet, a junior architect at the firm, didn't seem to mind how he looked. You realize I'm your boss now, Sergio reminded Clive. Clive snorted. Fine, Mr. Idiot. Sergio grinned, shook his head, and tried to concentrate on his work. Most of the department came to Sergio's promotion dinner. Considering it was short notice for everyone, Sergio thought that it was impressive. He hoped it was because he was well liked, and not because they were sucking up. But he couldn't tell. He could never tell with people. He couldn't read people, not even Violet, whom he'd been dating for almost a year. He was often unsure about what she was really thinking. Did she mean it when she said he was awesome? Or was she dating him because he was moving up in the firm and she thought he'd take her with him? That was why he had to rely on hard work to get him the life he wanted. He was never going to schmooze his way to the top. He could no more smooth than he could slam dunk a basketball. The dinner wasn't anything fancy. They all just traipsed across the street to the steakhouse that had been a fixture on the block well before the firm moved into the new office building the year before. But that was okay. The steakhouse had great food and had the kind of old world atmosphere Sergio liked. Wood paneled walls, leather chairs, dark stained tables, plush gold carpeting, and ornate wall sconces. Dale had reserved the restaurant's meeting room, and now as Sergio sat at the round table filled with his fellow architects, twelve of the fourteen in his department were here. Everyone was having a great time, joking, laughing, flirting. Strike that! Everyone but Sergio was having a great time. Yes, he was throwing out one-liners and laughing at the right times, but his heart wasn't in it. Ever since he'd gotten the news of his promotion, he'd been battling a sudden onset of depression he couldn't explain. What was wrong with him? 
she'd gotten good news, but it didn't feel good at all. So what's it like to be the new project manager? Violet asked as Sergio cut into his medium-rare ribeye. The grilled aroma of the beef on his plate combined with savory scents of butter and onions. His mouth watered as he watched pink juices run from the steak. He smeared the bite he just cut apart. Sergio looked at his freckled, brunette girlfriend. Short and pillowy, Violet was the picture of curvy femininity. To play up her soft features, Violet wore clothes with lots of trim and ruffles and color. Her wardrobe had sass, as she called it. She was always asking him if she looked sassy. He wasn't sure how sassy looked, so he always said, You look sassy as heck, babe. Basically, he lied. Looking at Violet now, Sergio realized he often lied when it came to Violet. Don't you just love romantic comedies? Violet had asked just the other night as they headed to the theater for yet another romantic comedy movie. Sure do, babe, Sergio said. He hated romantic comedies. Give him a good sci-fi or supernatural movie any day. Even horror was better than a romantic comedy. I hate horror movies, Violet had said on that second date. Don't you? Absolutely, Sergio said. The same kind of thing happened with food. Everyone seems to love Chinese food, Violet said on the third date. But I don't get the appeal. It's either too bland or too spicy. What do you think? I totally agree, Sergio said. Chinese takeout was one of his favorite things. Violet shows how they spent that time, too. On the first date, Violet announced that she was a go-getter. She let Sergio know that quiet nights at home would be rare. My mama always said, You stand still too long, Vi, and you'll sprout roots. You gotta keep rolling so you don't gather moss. So I like to keep moving, keep doing. When I'm not at work, I'm out having fun, you know? Sergio had nodded, even though he was still untangling her make the metaphors, and he really liked hanging out at home. Sure, he said. Life's too short to grow moss on your roots. Violet thought that was hilariously funny, which was nice because he liked it when people found his attempts at humor amusing. But it was equally not nice because Violet had a true obnoxious laugh, a cross between a honk, a siren, and a snore. Violet's laugh attracted attention the way syrup attracted flies. She'd embarrassed Sergio on dozens of occasions. He actually started trying not to be amusing. It didn't work. Apparently, he was the master of inadvertently saying funny things. Like just this evening, after Dale told him about the promotion, Sergio went to Violet's drafting table and told her the good news. There'll be a dinner tonight. I assume you want to come? She'd laughed as if he just told the best joke ever. He found that baffling. Yes, Violet was smart. And yes, they had shared interests. And yes, she was pretty fun. But wasn't really so much to want a girlfriend who liked more of the things he liked. He wondered if they'd be still dating if he told her the truth from the beginning. Would she even like him if she knew him? Really knew him? Heck, sometimes he wasn't sure if she liked the version of him that he was pretending to be. And sometimes he didn't like her much either. Violet was a flirt. Even though she was with Sergio, she liked to come on to other men. And not just some men. All men. Married or unmarried. She didn't care. She just liked to flirt. Sergio had never liked the flirting, but lately it was really getting on his nerves. Sergio? Sergio blinked and looked at Violet. She was tugging on his sleeve. I asked you a question. I'm sorry, what did you ask? I asked you how it feels to be the new project manager. Waiting until he'd put his first bite of steak in his mouth and shoot it, Sergio gave Violet what he hoped was a neutral look that didn't betray his annoyance at her. For once, he gave her an honest answer. Well, I'm not the project manager yet, 
Am I? So I don't know. Violet let loose with a laugh. Sergio looked down and quickly took another bite of steak. The biggest issue in his relationship was that, well, Violet wasn't the girl he really wanted. But that girl was someone he hadn't seen in years. He wondered what she was doing now. Sophia Manchester started going to Sergio's high school during his junior year. He fell in love with her on the first day she came to class. Small and graceful like a ballerina, Sophie had the dark looks he loved, and she had the face of an angel. She was also very smart, very nice, very funny, and, unfortunately, very popular. Although she was always perfectly kind to him, and he'd noticed she seemed to like a lot of the same things he liked, they moved in entirely different circles. He didn't stand a chance, but he never forgot her. In the nearly ten years since he'd seen her, he'd been trying to find a woman like her. Violet, sadly, wasn't that woman. Violet patted his leg, then turned away from him to flirt with Clive, even though only an airhead would flirt with Clive. Everyone knew Clive was obviously taken by outspoken red-haired Fiona who sat on his other side now, and Fiona was not a woman to be messed with. Case in point, when Violet leaned toward Clive to rub her chest against his arm, a spoonful of Fiona's mashed potatoes flew across the table and onto Violet's new blouse. Oh, sorry, Fiona purred in a smooth, confident voice. I don't know how that got away from me. Violet sniffed loudly and extricated the potatoes from a blouse. She leaned away from Clive. Sergio surprised a smile and concentrated on his steak. The steak was the best part of this evening's celebration. He could have done without the forced camaraderie. Being friendly with other people was hard work, and he was tired tonight. He wanted to go home and stop trying for just a few hours, but he couldn't do that yet. He had to keep eating and bantering and pretending all was right in the world, after most of the plates on the table had been cleared away by the waiters. Dale stood and tapped his water glass. The ding 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 brought up every head at the table. So Serge, Dale said, we want a speech. You know we do. Everyone except Clive started chanting. Speech, speech, speech. Clive was mouthing. Idiot at Sergio. Sergio smiled and stood. I'll make this short and sweet. Everyone cheered. Dale laughed. See? There's a reason this kid has advanced so quickly. Sergio grinned, as he knew he was supposed to. Well, here we go. Thank you, Dale. To you and the partners for the promotion. Dale inclined his head, smiling. You deserve it. Sergio smiled. And to the rest of you. He lowered his voice to a growl. You're mine now, maggots. And don't you forget it. He sat down. The table was silent for at least three seconds. Then Clive burst out laughing and started clapping. Violet joined in. And then everyone was laughing. Phew! For a second, Sergio thought he'd blown it. Of course, Violet wanted to go out dancing after the dinner. And she convinced Sergio to invite Clive and Fiona and a couple other architects. Even though Sergio enjoyed showing off his dance moves, they stayed up ridiculously late. Finally, Sergio took Violet home and then headed to his own apartment building a few blocks away. Pulling his two-year-old SUV into his assigned space in the garage under his apartment building, Sergio picked up his suit jacket from the leather passenger seat. He stepped out of the black vehicle, then closed and locked the doors. For a few seconds, he stood and stared at his SUV. He remembered how excited he was when he bought it. He had been wanting to trade in his old small pickup for a nice SUV for years. Once he'd done it though, he realized he still didn't have the vehicle he truly desired. 
Why was it that whenever he climbed a little higher on the ladder, he felt like he still had too many rungs to go before he reached the top? Sighing, Sergio left his SUV behind him and took the elevator to the third floor. There, he strode to his apartment, hurrying quietly with his back to his neighbor's door. Mrs. Bailey was a busybody, and she liked to ambush him when he got home. Only once in a while did he manage to get past. Oh, it's just you, Sergio. Mrs. Bailey's scratchy voice said as Sergio put his key in his lock. I thought I had an intruder. You're quite late tonight, hot date. Sergio took a breath, then turned. Hi, Mrs. Bailey. The petite, gray-haired lady beamed at him. In the daytime, she usually wore crisply ironed shirt dresses in pastel colors, but tonight she was sporting a frilly pink nightgown under a white quilted robe. How was what today? Fine. Sergio wasn't going to tell her about the promotion. Oh no, she would have insisted on inviting him in for some kind of big good in spite of the time. He yawned, not a fake yawn, just a well-timed one. I'm awfully tired, Mrs. Bailey. Please forgive me, but I need to go inside and go to bed. Of course you do, dear. Mrs. Bailey smiled at him. You go get your rest. Sergio thanked his lucky stars and slipped into his apartment before Mrs. Bailey could say anything else. He closed the door behind him and lashed all four latches. He leaned back against the door and closed his eyes. Home at last. Sergio had a nice apartment. At 1,200 square feet, it was far from tiny, and the complex had been built only two years before. It sported the most up-to-date appliances and modern features that his architectural eye appreciated. A couple friends from the firm had helped Sergio decorate his apartment, and it looked good. They'd used neutral beiges and greys that felt both upscale and masculine, and most of the furnishings were expensive antiques. It was a decent place, but he resented that it was in a building that also housed the likes of Mrs. Bailey. He deserved peace, didn't he? He shouldn't have to put up with a nosy old lady who didn't have anything better to do than torment him. Sergio crossed the living room and went into his bedroom. Removing his wallet from his pocket, he placed it in the ceramic tray he used for his wallet and keys and whatever other detritus might come out of his pockets at the end of the day. He then undressed and carefully hung up his suit and put everything else in a laundry hamper. Tugging on grey sweats and a black t-shirt, he laid down on the bed and dropped immediately into sleep. The next morning, his alarm woke him at 6 o'clock a.m. Feeling groggy and foggy, he groaned and turned on the TV. Flipping through the channels, he thought about the long day he had ahead. He should get moving. He looked at the phone on his Queen Anne cherry nightstand. He checked his watch. It wasn't too early. He picked up the phone, leaning back on a pile of grey, white, and beige pillows. Sergio listened to the phone ring. It was picked up on the third one. Hello? His mother's lightly accented voice said. Mama? Sergio said. Sergio! What a nice surprise! Something rustled against the phone, and her voice was muffled as she called. Tony! Come here! It's Sergio on the phone! Her voice returned to full volume and beyond when she shouted into the phone. Sergio? You still there? I'm putting you on speaker. Your papa is doing his morning workout. Tony! Come here! Come talk to Sergio on the speaker! Sergio shook his head. His mother sure did love her speakerphone. Who is our Sergio? A deep voice boomed into the phone. Have you built any skyscrapers lately? The machine gun laugh that came after this ridiculous question was joined by his mother's wild giggling. Sergio shook his head again. 
You know I don't build skyscrapers, Papa. I'm in the residential renovation department of the firm. So renovate skyscraper apartment buildings. In a town where the tallest building is ten stories high? You have to be visionary, son, if you want it at all. You can't reach the top without being able to see the top. You have to be bold and daring to stand out. Tony Alteri knew all about being bold and daring and being on the top. The head of a massive transportation company. Sergio's dad was one impressive man. By the time Sergio was born, when Tony was 30, Tony had already built his empire and a mansion for his wife and new baby. Since then, his business only continued to grow. Today, he not only filled his mansion with the best furniture and art and cars, but he also bought more houses to fill with furniture, art and cars. I got a promotion today, Sergio said. The one I told you I applied for. I got it. Head of the company? Tony asked, laughing again. Tony, be nice, Sergio's mother said. Congratulations, Sergio. We're so proud of you. We need to have a celebration. Your favorite pasta and cake. We have to have a cake. What was the job you applied for again? Project manager. That sounds nice, his mother said. Tony snorted. Don't rest on your laurels, Sergio. Always upward. Did you catch the game last night? Sergio noticed he was gritting his teeth, and he forced himself to relax. I saw the score. I missed the game because we all went out to dinner to celebrate my promotion. Did you miss anyone? Sergio's mother asked. No, Mama. It was just the people in my department. Violet is the only woman there who's interested in me. They got no taste, Tony said. At least Violet knows a good thing when she sees it. Sergio's mother snorted. She wasn't Violet's biggest fan. Sergio made his excuses to get off the phone as fast as he could. He was asking himself why he called his parents to begin with. Well, he knew why he called them. He called them to get validation. He was trying to feel like he'd finally gotten enough to have arrived. Why in the world did he think he'd get that validation from his father? All the rich food he ate the night before must have slowed down his brain function. Sergio's new office was outstanding. His new job was not. The office wasn't huge. It wasn't a corner office or anything. Honestly, it was just a small playroom tucked between the break room and a conference room. But it was his. Plus, his windows had shades, which for some reason were missing from the windows out on the design floor. Sergio happily pulled those shades down when the sun came around to spear his eyes at two in the afternoon. The shade-pulling moment was, however, the only heavy moment of the day. The rest of the day was just a mind-numbing blur as he tried to get up to speed with what Sanders had been doing. Or rather, had not been doing. After just two hours of assessing the situation, he understood why Sanders had left earlier than expected. This was not a job for one person. It was a job for at least ten people, plus assistants. Clive was right. Sergio was an idiot. He hadn't been told when his pay raise would be before he applied for the promotion, but he figured it would be a decent increase. He was wrong. He was only going to get another a thousand a month. To do ten times more work. Idiot. He muttered to himself. As he tried to organize the few tasks he thought he might be able to get done today. If he stayed until nearly midnight. Sergio's door opened and Clive's head popped in. Along with the aromas wafting over from the break room. Sergio could smell coffee, popcorn and someone's microwaved burritos. How's the new job? Clive asked. Sergio dropped his head to the pile of paperwork in front of him and pounded it a couple times. That good, huh? Clive came the rest of the way into the room and sat in one of the narrow leather and stainless steel chairs in front of Sergio. He looked round at Sergio's plain oak desk, the other chair, the shelves piled with project files, and the drafting table tucked in the corner. So you do have a drafting table? Clive noted. Think you'll get used to it? Sergio didn't answer the question. Instead, he asked, 
Do you ever think we reach our ideals? Clive turned sideways and put his feet up on the other chair in front of the desk. That's a deep question. Sorry, I know you hate to use your dozen or so brain cells to think about deep questions. Yeah, you're stressing me out here. Never mind. Oh, it's a good question. Honest answer? I don't think ideals are actually real. I think they exist only in our heads. I mean, have you ever drawn something that was as good as you imagined it in your head? You have? I'll buy you dinner every night for a week. Because I sure haven't. As tempting as it is to lie to get those dinners, Sergio said grinning. No, I haven't. There you go. We're all a bunch of donkeys. What? You know, the carrot and the stick? We're just a bunch of donkeys plodding along trying to reach a carrot that will forever dangle out in front of us, no matter how far we plod. That's depressing. Clive shrugged and shook his head, doing an unintentional impression of Bubbles, the Labradoodle. Then my work is done, he grinned. Seriously. I don't think it's depressing at all. It's kind of freezing when you think about it. If we can't ever get what we want, why bother trying? Just do your best and have a good time. He paused and saluted. Mr. Idiot, sir! He bowed multiple times as he backed out of Sergio's office. Sergio laughed, then sobered and tried to concentrate on the work. Two and a half weeks into the new position, Sergio had doubled his caffeine consumption, and still he was constantly ten paces behind. He'd already made two dumb mistakes that cost the firm several thousand dollars, and he'd already been berated twice by a client. Dale assured him this was a normal part of the learning curve for the project manager's job, but Sergio was still mortified. He was also bored and disappointed. He thought that becoming the project manager would give him more leeway to implement cutting-edge design ideas, more freedom to break past the boundaries of the usual renovation his department did. For some time, he was frustrated by the safe, limited changes that clients made to their homes. He wanted to be given carte blanche to bust into a place, demo the heck out of it, and turn it into something else entirely. He thought a project manager would hold enough sway that he could make that vision a reality. He was wrong. The projects he had to oversee were the same old things, and now, in addition to disliking the types of jobs he was working on, he had a responsibility for more aspects of those jobs. This new position really was just more work and no more satisfaction. Not only was work in full suck mode, but his home life, such as it was, had gone down the toilet as well. Mrs. Bailey had taken to staying up late so she could greet him with her latest suggestions for getting more sleep. Then there was the tenant who lived above him. The woman who had the apartment on the next floor up took dancing lessons. He'd been listening to her stomping around above his head for weeks. He didn't know her name, but he'd given her the title of Thunderfeet. Now, for some reason, Thunderfeet was practicing until 2 o'clock a.m. He tried to talk to her about it one night, but after scolding him for ringing her doorbell too late, she called him names that made him blush. Also, because he never had time to go to the grocery store, he was eating more takeout, and because he was so tired when he got home, he rarely exercised and instead just dropped into bed. These two changes had resulted in a disturbing pot belly that was growing with each passing day. Sergio's dissatisfaction was growing with each passing day too. So were the number of hours he was working. It was near midnight most nights when he left the firm. And he always came home with a stack of work to look over before he went to bed. As if all this wasn't bad enough, Violet hated Sergio's new long hours even more than he did and it was turning her into a nag. How came you have to work all the time, Sergio? She asked him on Saturday night, at the end of his first week as project manager. They were at a party she insisted they attend, even though they couldn't get there until after 10.30pm, because he worked until then. He knew she was going to want to stay until at least 2 or later, and then he was going to have to get up and go into work early Sunday morning. If he didn't, there was no way he could handle Monday. Um, because it's part of the new job? Sergio said with a thick layer of sarcasm. The new job I just got promoted into? It's a high workload job. What do you suggest I do? 
could just saw and cut the workload in half? He never should have said that. Violet laughed hysterically, and everyone at the party turned to stare at them. And so it went. Work. Try and please his girlfriend. Get home late. Deal with Mrs. Bailey. Eat junk. Listen to Thunderfeet. Finally go to sleep. Rinse and repeat. His days were basically drudgery. The only few minutes in them that he really liked were those moments when he walked out of the building, admired his dedicated project manager's parking spot. Now there was a perk worth working your tail off for. Not! Strolled to it and got in his car. That was his fleeting moment of freedom. Every night, he got just a few seconds of joy in the feeling of escape. But even that was beyond his reach on this rainy Tuesday night. Because the forecast had been for the usual sunshine, Sergio wasn't prepared for rain. Even though his new parking spot was only 20 feet from the firm's door. Even though his new parking spot was only 20 feet from the firm's door, he and his stack of papers were soaked when he got into his SUV. And he was cold. And he was hungry. Sergio put his papers on the passenger seat. He turned on the heat for blast which caused the vehicle to steam up, and his wool suit started smelling like a wet farm animal. Or was that his own smell? He didn't know. Personal hygiene was another thing this job was taking from him. Pulling out of the parking lot, Sergio couldn't help but notice he had the road mostly to himself. It had been like this every night this week, which was why it was not just annoying but screamingly inconvenient when his two-year-old SUV decided to die in the totally closed down and deserted retail district of downtown. Sergio was barely able to coast to the curb before the SUV lost all momentum and drifted to a full, silent stop. Sergio looked at the still bright dashboard lights, not the battery. He looked at the gas tank, which was half full, not out of gas. Are you kidding me? Sergio asked his vehicle. It had no response. He tried to restart the SUV, nothing. There was no point in him looking under the hood. He knew nothing about vehicle engines. So, Sergio sat in the dead SUV and listened to rain thundering on the roof. He tried to see through the grey murk of the falling water. Everything outside the SUV was vague and obscure, but from what he could tell, no one was around. He peered into the gloom looking for an open sign on one of the storefronts. He didn't see any. This block had no bars or restaurants, so nothing was open. He thought about where he was, and he remembered there was a gas station two blocks over. Hopefully, he could get a tow truck here. But that meant walking in the rain for ten minutes. Oh, joy. Sergio leaned his head on the steering wheel. What a perfectly awful end to a perfectly awful week. Sergio raised his head and looked at the still wet stack of papers sitting on the passenger seat. He had the urge to pick them up and throw them out in the rain. He could see himself doing it in his mind's eye, and he could see himself dancing around on top of them. Blowing out air, Sergio motioned at the dead car and said, Camel's back! Meet your last draw. The rain started coming down harder. Sergio leaned back in his seat and closed his eyes. How had he gotten here? After all his hard work, all his striving, all his determination, after all that comes this, a broken down SUV in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain? Fine. Sergio opened the door and stepped out into the weather. He was soaked immediately. He slammed the SUV's driver's door, stomped forward two feet, and kicked the front tire as hard as he could. Ouch! Sergio screamed. He hopped around on one foot and marveled at how much pain a tow could generate. Water slid down inside his collar and his hopping foot splashed the water up his pants leg. Resisting the edge to kick his vehicle again, Sergio stomped away from it. Then he pulled his ruined suit jacket up over his head as a makeshift hood, and he slouched over to the sidewalk. There, he put his head down and trudged away. The street lights provided enough illumination for him to see the sidewalk cracks and the cab. This was all he needed for navigation. He'd gone just a block when the rain started to let up. Not really caring at this point, because he was already wet through and through, Sergio kept walking. 
but then two things happened at once. The rain stopped entirely, and Sergio nearly tripped over an overstepped green garbage bag lying in the middle of the sidewalk. Sergio lowered his suit coat, and he looked around. The nearest streetlight poured pale yellow light down on a dumpster that had tipped partway over. Its contents were spilled all over the sidewalk. Partially eaten food, sodden papers, and collapsed latte cups were strewn all around. Sergio began taking careful steps through the trash. He'd gone a couple of feet when the streetlight's glow hit something brightly covered. Sergio assumed it was a plastic ball or cup, but even so, he glanced at it as he passed. He stopped. It wasn't a plastic ball or cup. It was... What was it? Curious about the unique shape standing out among the ordinary refuse, Sergio took a step closer to it. It was a bright red propeller on top of a cap. Leaning over, Sergio discovered that the propeller cap was attached to the round head of a small, maybe 10-inch high, plastic figurine. The figurine was that of a small boy with reddish-brown hair, big blue eyes, an orange triangular nose, rosy cheeks, and a wide mouth full of pronounced white teeth. The figurine's round head was matched in shape and size with the trunk of its body, which resembled a colorful bowling ball with arms and legs. The figurine was wearing a short-sleeved, two-button shirt that had vertical red and blue stripes matching the pattern on the cap. The shirt was tucked into solid blue pants, and the pants cuffs ended at the top of a pair of plain brown shoes. The shoes were more rounded than foot-shaped, but they matched the boy's fingerless, stumpy hands. The figurine's right hand held a large red and yellow striped balloon, and the figurine's left hand held a small sign that read, I'm a lucky boy. You are, are you? Sergio playfully asked the figurine. Do you have any tips? I'll give you some luck. I'm a lucky boy, the figurine said in a high-pitched child's voice. Sergio widened his eyes and stared. This wasn't just a figurine. It was an electronic toy. Surprised the toy was still working despite sitting in the rain. He was intrigued enough to pick it up. Wet, cold, hard, and slippery, the toy was light in weight. And though it looked old-fashioned, it was in great condition. No paint was scarred or faded. Sergio turned the toy this way and that, looking for a control switch. He couldn't see one. He checked for a speaker and saw none. He even scanned for a battery compartment, but found nada. Interesting. So was, I'm a lucky boy, all the toy said. Just for fun, Sergio decided to talk to the toy. You say you're a lucky boy, like your son says. Good for you. Good for you, the toy said. Oh, okay. The toy probably had some stock phrases to play, and it was programmed to repeat back what it heard, that is, recorded. Its inner workings were surprisingly well hidden. It didn't seem like a cheap toy. Sergio decided to test his theory about the recording. He said, Testing, testing. The little toy didn't repeat the words. Instead, it said, It's lucky to be lucky. Then it intermitted a funny little ha-he-he-ha -he -he -ha giggle. Sergio smiled. The giggle was infectious. Sergio looked around. He was still alone. He looked back at the toy and shrugged. Do you have a name? Sergio asked the toy. My name is Lucky Boy, the toy said. Sergio snorted. I <laughs> never would have guessed. Sergio wondered if Lucky Boy was worth anything. Probably not. But either way, he found he couldn't leave it lying there. It was unique, and it looked antique. He loved unique antiques. He'd made them part of his home decor. Tucking the toy under his arm, Sergio walked on, and within five minutes, he was in the gas station, convenience store, making arrangements to have his car towed. While he signed paperwork, he set Lucky Boy on the counter. The teenage clerk behind the counter called the tow truck driver, and then returned to the counter to watch Sergio sign papers. The teen was acne-spotted and limp-haired, 
but he was dressed in a clean blue uniform shirt with khaki pants, and he was friendly enough. So are your car broke down, dude, he said. Hey, do you want to buy a lottery ticket for tomorrow's drawing? It could help pay for car repairs. No thanks, Sergio said. He was trying not to breathe deeply because the gas station convenience store smelled like pork rinds and dirty socks. But he involuntarily sucked in air when Lucky Boy said in his soprano-toned child's voice, It's your lucky day! Hey, dude, the teen said. Cool doll. It's not a doll. Okay, whatever. Still cool. Sergio looked at Lucky Boy and shrugged. Okay, I'll take that ticket after all. Who knows? Exactly. The clerk beamed. He rang up a ticket. It was nearly 3 o'clock a.m. when the tow truck driver dropped Sergio off at his apartment building. Sergio didn't bother to explain Lucky Boy to the heavyset driver, who eyed the toy and Sergio with suspicion. Tiptoeing through the hallway outside of his apartment, he managed to open and close his door without being pestered. It seemed there was an hour past, which Mrs. Bailey would not stay up. He looked at the toy he still carried. Maybe it is my lucky day, after all. Lucky Boy emitted his mischievous giggle. Smiling, Sergio took Lucky Boy into his bedroom and set him on top of his cherry bureau next to the ceramic tray. Then he emptied his soggy pockets, stripped off his ruined clothes, took a hot shower, and fell into bed. Two and a half hours later, his alarm nearly catapulted him across the room. Groaning, Sergio sleepwalked through getting dressed. Then he called a cab. Any wise words? Sergio asked Lucky Boy before he left the apartment. Lucky Boy giggled and said again, Today is your lucky day! Sergio couldn't say he agreed with that assessment, but technically the day was still ongoing. Who knew what could happen? Running on just two and a half hours of sleep, he sure could use a little luck. The day went by in his sleep-deprived blur. He was a walking zombie, and when Dale corrected him on his math for the tenth time, the last time being when Sergio added six and seven and came up with fifteen, he finally admitted, Dale, I'm sorry. I'm asleep on my feet. My ACV broke down in the rain last night. I got two and a half hours of sleep. Go home. Dale said. Sergio flinched. Was he being fired? Dale laughed. You're not being punished. We're not total ogres here. When you need sleep, you need sleep. Go home and sleep. When you come back, maybe you can tell me again what 6 plus 7 is. When Sergio let Violet know he was leaving, she offered to lend him her car. I can get someone to take me to your place later to get it. Then we can go out to that gallery opening I wanted us to go to. You'll be rested up enough by the end of the day, right? Sergio started to nod, then he stopped himself. He didn't want to go to a gallery opening. If this was his lucky day, didn't he deserve to tell the truth for a change? He shook his head and refused to accept the car keys while it was thrusting in his direction. I'm just going to call a cab, he said. Then I'm going to go to sleep and sleep straight through until morning. I don't want to go out later. Violet gave him a little pout he used to think was kind of cute. He turned away from her and headed back to his office to call a cab. On his way home in the cab, Sergio had a news report about the big lottery, something about one of the winners buying a winning ticket at a gas station downtown. He wondered if it was a gas station he went to the previous night. He should check his ticket. By the time Sergio turned home though, he was in a semi-conscious state. He didn't have enough energy to check his lottery ticket. Instead, he fell into bed and slept for four hours. He woke a little after 8 o'clock p.m. And feeling not even a little guilty about his latest lie to Violet, he ordered a pepperoni pizza. Taking it into his bed because he was still too tired to think, Sergio turned on the TV. The local news was ending. The perky female co-anchor said, And to end on a light note, five people drew the winning numbers for the latest big jackpot. One of these tickets was bought right here in our town. Congratulations to the winner, whoever you are. That's right, the ticket. Sergio jumped off the bed. He dashed to his ceramic tray and dug for the ticket. Grabbing it, he picked up his phone. Bringing up the winning numbers on the screen, 
he compared them to the numbers on his ticket. He blinked and compared them again. They matched. Every number matched. Sergio jumped up and shouted, Yes! Above him, thunder feet pounded on the floor. Same to you! He shouted. Sergio ran to the bureau and picked up Lucky Boy. He held the toy out like a dance partner and spun around the room. You're brilliant! Absolutely brilliant! Lucky Boy sounded off his funny little giggle. Sergio mimicked the giggle and threw himself on his bed. He kicked his feet in the air and whooped. Thunder feet pounded again. To hell with you! He shouted. He wasn't going to put up with crap anymore. He had the means to fix all the problems he had in his life now. Oh yeah, things were going to change. The next day, Sergio called in sick to work. When Violet telephoned later to check on him, he let the answering machine pick it up. Then he visited the lottery headquarters to claim his winnings. Because he was one of five people who had the winning numbers, after taxes, he ended up with just a little over $600,000. That was okay. It was plenty. Back at home, Sergio relaxed in his living room and pondered what to do next. He had so many choices now. The car repair place had called to tell him it had an oil leak that bled the vehicle drive oil. The resulting engine damage would cost thousands to repair. Should he spend it, or just sell the thing as it was for parts and get something new? Grinning, Sergio stood and went to get Lucky Boy. Carrying the toy back into the living room, and feeling only a little silly, he asked Lucky Boy, Should I repair my car or get a new one? You deserve good things! Lucky Boy sang out, You're right, I do. Sergio sat back and put Lucky Boy in his lap. What kind of car do I deserve? You deserve to have your dreams come true. Really? Sergio thought about his dream car. The car he'd always wanted. A car that his father had once called an impractical waste of money. This from a man who had 17 cars. Wasn't having more than two or three cars an impractical waste of money? You don't buy cars for flash, son. Tony always said. You buy them for value. You buy Flash, and you're just asking to be ripped off. You'll pay more than the car is worth, and you'll be a magnet for car thieves. What if I like Flash? Sergio asked out loud now. You deserve Flash! Lucky Boy piped up. What should I buy? Sergio asked. Buy a flashy sports car. The more expensive, the better. Sergio fired off a finger gun at the little toy. I like how you think. He ignored the part of him that was a smidge and creeped out by the fact that he was having a conversation with a toy. Lucky Boy had given him better advice than he'd ever gotten from anyone else. Who was he to care about where that advice came from? So, he bought a bright red, expensive, flashy sports car. High-end, highly visible, and as impressive as all get out. Sergio's new car made him feel way more impressive than his silly aviator-style watch. And speaking of his watch... What kind of watch should I buy? He asked Lucky Boy after he got home with his new car. You deserve bling! Sergio got dressed and headed back out in his flashy car. He went to the best jewelry store in town, and he spent $37,000 on a new gold watch. It was impressive. After he got the watch, he stopped and called a Violet. She just gotten home from work. How would you like to have dinner at the Horizon? He asked, grinning, when she sucked in her breath. The Horizon was the best restaurant in town. Violet squealed. What's the occasion? I'll tell you when I pick you up. Meet me out front of your building. I thought your SUV was still in the shop, she said. It is. I bought myself a new ride. It's red. You can't miss it. Okay, Violet said, drawing out the word as if she thought he'd lost his marbles. He laughed and hung up, driving to Violet's apartment building and revving the engine as he neared her building. He stomped on the accelerator to zoom forward, then slammed on the brakes, coming to a screeching stop next to the curb just a foot from her. She stared in open-mouthed shock at his new wheels. What do you think? 
he asked as the powerful engine rumbled and she gaped at the car. How? Violet asked. Project managers don't make that much more than senior architects. Get in. I'll tell you about it. Violet beamed at Tim as she opened the door. Over a steak and lobster dinner, complete with huge slices of the most decadent chocolate cake he'd ever eaten. Sergio told Violet about his lottery win. He didn't, however, tell her about Lucky Boy. That somehow seemed like a secret he needed to keep to himself. And he should have kept the lottery win to himself, too. Violet immediately started telling him how he should spend the money. You should buy a boat, she told him as she plowed through her slice of cake. We could go out on the lake every weekend. Oh, and you should buy a timeshare. Then we could go to different places every weekend. Or maybe we should just take a trip around the world. Oh, wait, a cruise. We should take a cruise. Or we could go... Sergio wasn't really listening to her. He was savoring the amazing chocolate cake. But he said, "Mm Mm-hmm. At appropriate intervals. Until he noticed she wasn't talking anymore. He also noticed when she whacked his knuckles with her fork. Ow! What? I said, what is that? She gestured at his new watch. Oh, yeah. Sergio suddenly remembered. I forgot to show this to you. I just got it this afternoon. It cost $37,000, but I deserve it. Sergio took another bite of cake. Violet touched the watch reverently and beamed. She looked at him, her eyes bright. So what did you get me? I was wondering all evening. I figured you have to have gotten me something since you want all that money. I figure you're saving it for the end of dinner. But now I can't wait any longer. What did you get me? Sergio set down his fork. He looked down. What? Violet asked. You did get me something, right? Sergio winced. Um, you got yourself a new sports car and a $37,000 watch, and you didn't give me anything? Violet's voice arose at least an octave at the end of the question. I, uh, think, he told himself. Surely he could come up with some good reason he didn't buy anything. Violet stood and threw down her napkin. Take me home right now! Sergio didn't argue. He didn't have the energy. And he realized he didn't care that she was angry. He just took her home. There, Violet got out of the car and started to walk away. Then she turned back and said, You better have something for me tomorrow. She marched off, her hips swaying emphatically in her wake. Sergio didn't give Violet a thought after he left her apartment building. He was feeling too good to be bothered by her tantrum. When he got home, Sergio showed his watch to Lucky Boy. What do you think? He asked. Lucky Boy giggled. You look impressive. The next day, Sergio put on his new watch and went to work in his new car. Nice wheels, Clive said, when he walked into Sergio's office a little after nine. This position must pay more than I thought it did. Close the door, Sergio said. He would learned his lesson from Violet. Telling people about his lottery win could be tricky. Clive raised his eyebrows and closed the door. He flopped into one of Sergio's visitor chairs. What's the big secret? Did you rob a bank? No, Sergio grinned. He lowered his voice. I won the lottery. Clive laughed. <laughs> Good one. Really, I bought a ticket because... Sergio stopped himself. He'd been about to tell Clive about Lucky Boy. He again got the strong feeling he should keep that bit to himself. He covered his near mistake by saying, Because I had a whim, and I won. Clive shook his head. Good for you! He spotted Sergio's watch. Nice bling! Sergio flushed. I deserve some bling. Sure you do. So, what's next? Oh, I know. How about you buy your good friend, Clive, a swimming pool? Unlike Violet, Clive was kidding. Or at least Sergio hoped he was. He decided to go with a kidding response. Ha! Sergio rolled his eyes. Win your own lottery. Then you can buy your own swimming pool. Party pooper. When I buy my swimming pool, you can come and use it. Are you buying one? Sergio shrugged. Actually... I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I need to ask... Oops. He almost let it slip again. 
Clive looked at him. Who are you going to ask? Your mummy? Sergio flipped a pen at Clive. Funny. No, not my mummy. I mean, just ask, you know, in general. Like, ask my intuition, ask the universe, like that. When did you get spiritual? Having money is an exalting experience. Clive laughed. Well, even so, you'd better get to work. Dale was on a rampage yesterday about having to pick up your load because you were out sick, and the Jenkins project is kind of a mess. Sergio frowned. I'm not criticizing, Clive said. I couldn't do what you've been doing half as well as you have, but I'm just warning you that the powers that be aren't going to care about your car or your bling. Sergio sighed. You're right, obviously. I made a mess of things a couple days ago. I need to fix it. Clive stood, leaning over Sergio's desk, and raised his hand. High five! Sergio slapped Clive's hand. I'm honestly happy for you, Clive said. Enjoy! Just don't cut off your nose to spite your face. What does that even mean? Sergio asked. I'm not really sure. It's just what my mother said whenever I did something dumb and reacted to something. Actually, I don't think it's applicable here. But whatever. Just be careful with your decisions. Yes, Dad. Clive laughed and left Sergio's office. Sergio stared at his watch for several minutes and then got to work and he was still working long after everyone else left. Even Violet. She wasn't speaking to him. It was after midnight when he left the building and headed for his... Where was his car? His nice new bright and shiny sports car wasn't in his parking space. What the heck? Sergei turned a full circle in his empty parking spot. Then he signed, went back inside his office, and called the police. The police officer, who took his stolen car report was nice enough to give Sergio a ride home. That was kind of fun. Sergio enjoyed listening to the chatter on the police radio, and he liked the way the leather creaked when he moved in his seat. He wasn't as keen on the weird smell coming from the back seat, a combination of bleach and something sour smelling. He didn't ask about it. Sorry you got your car stolen the first folder you owned it, the young officer said when he pulled up outside Sergio's building. His name tag read Neil, which Sergio assumed was the last name. That bites the big one. Sergio unbuckled his seatbelt and turned toward Officer Neil. He noticed the officer's buzz cut was recent. He could see white skin between his brown hair and the tan line on his neck. And you don't think I'll get it back? It's probably out of the state by now, Neil said. Or it's in parts. His voice broke often like a teenager going through puberty. Sergio shook his head. Well, at least it wasn't short. He reached for the passenger door handle. Yeah, but they get you there too. You'll get blue book for it, but that won't be as much as he paid for it. You're out taxes and license and all that. Sergio smiled at Neil as he pushed the door open. Well, you're a ray of sunshine. Neil laughed. Sorry, this job needs to create pessimists. Sergio marveled that Officer Neil had been on the job long enough to become a pessimist. He wondered what Officer Neil's goals were. Did he have a big dream? Thanks for the ride, Sergio said as he got out of the squad car. He waved as Neil drove away, and he went in the front entrance of his building, whistling. He wasn't going to let this get him down. It was just a little setback. His luck had changed, or maybe not. As he got in the elevator and pushed the button for the fourth floor, his upstairs neighbor dashed up behind him and shoved her way past him. He flicked a look of annoyance at her. She mistook it for something else. What are you looking at? Thunderfeet snapped as she pounded on the fifth floor button. Wearing tight exercise pants and a sports bra, she must have thought he was admiring her. He wasn't. Not that she was bad looking. She was actually cute, slender and just curvy enough with blonde hair and a nice face. But she was too tall for him. She was at least 5 feet 10 to his 5 feet 7. Not to mention, her personality ruined everything about her looks. Nothing, Sergio said as the elevator made a clunking sound and started to rise. Nothing at all. Thunderfeet didn't smell good. She smelled like sweat and cigarette smoke. He concentrated on breathing through his mouth. She sniffed and looked at him sideways. You better not wake me up again tonight. 
Sergio glanced at her incredulously. Me wake you up? She glared at him. He ignored her as the elevator doors opened and he got out on his floor. One of the cheap beige carpet squares that covered the hallways in the building was sticking up just outside the elevator, and he tripped over it. He managed to catch himself, but he staggered a few feet before he did. He heard her mutter, Loser, as the elevator doors closed behind him. His shoulders tightened as he started down the hall, and by the time he was at his door, his good mood was slipping away. And, just as he took out his keys, Mrs. Bailey threw her door open behind him and sang out, I just made oatmeal raisin cookies! Sergio whirled around and yelled, I hate raisins! Mrs. Bailey, a plastic wrap covered plate of cookies extended out in front of her, drew back. Her face bunched up in the middle, like someone pulled on the drawstring attached to her skin. Her lower lip quivered, Well, why have you never said so? I was being polite! Sergio shouted, But I don't feel like being polite right now! In fact, I don't feel like being here right now. I just want to be left alone. Mrs. Bailey's eyes moistened. She nodded her head and quietly retreated into her apartment. Sergio felt like a jerk, but he also felt exhilarated. Saying what he wanted was so freeing. Inside his apartment, Sergio went through his usual post-work routine. When he finished, now wearing his sweats and t-shirt, he looked at Lucky Boy, who still sat all jaunty and bright, on top of the bureau. So, what should I do now? Sergio asked the toy. Everyone who someone should have a house, Lucky Boy said. Sergio stared at the toy's wide smile, and he began smiling just as wide. What a great idea! His own house! Why not buy his own house? He had plenty of money now for a down payment. He said so to Lucky Boy, praising him with, You're brilliant! Lucky Boy wasn't done throwing out ideas. Cash is king, Lucky Boy said. Go from bad to good. That's even more brilliant. This was the toy's best idea yet. He could buy an inexpensive fixer-upper with cash, gut it, and then completely redesign it. He could use all the skills he'd honed at the firm to create a true masterpiece of reinvention. You are so smart, Sergio told Lucky Boy. He gave the toy a pat on one of his rosy cheeks. Lucky Boy giggled. Sergio headed to the phone. He needed to contact a real estate agent. To go places, you gotta have wheels, Lucky Boy said. Sergio stopped. He turned to Lucky Boy and laughed. Well, I'm glad someone in this room is thinking. I forgot I have no car. He frowned. What should I get this time? The same thing? You should have bigger and better. Lucky Boy said. Sergio punched the air. Perfect! You're absolutely right. I'll get a big pickup. He turned her head toward the phone again. That's what I'll do first. And he did. In the morning, he drove his new black eight-cylinder extra cab long bed lifted pickup with massive tires to work. Yeah, it was a Saturday, and he wished he could be out looking at houses. But since he'd missed work on Thursday, he was totally behind. Even without missing that day, he'd have had to work today. Now he was going to have to work tomorrow, too. When he parked it in his spot, he decided it looked even more impressive than the red sports car. Seeing the shiny black and chrome road monster sitting in his reserve spot almost made up for being at the office on Saturday for the third week in a row. Sergio locked his truck and gave the hood a pat. He'd had the dealer add an upgraded security system to his new truck, so he knew he'd find the truck here waiting for him at the end of the day. If someone tried to take his baby, that someone was going to have a very bad day. The dealer had been happy to sell Sergio the security upgrade, but he'd been strangely against Sergio's request to have a full suspension lift added to the truck. Sergio would have thought the guy would be happy to make more money, but instead he warned, I let the truck as a tilt or tip has it. You'd be amazed at how easy it is to roll a truck when it's lifted. Sergio thanked him for the warning, but told him to do it anyway, and he was glad he did, feeling like he was at least three inches taller than he was before. He felt even taller 
when he got to his office and received a phone call from his insurer. They were going to pay out the full purchase price of his stolen vehicle and the taxes and licensing costs were being refunded because they didn't go through before the car was taken. So much for Officer Neil's pessimism. Ha! Sergio was on a roll. Or maybe not. When Sergio got off the phone, he looked up to find Violet standing in his office doorway. Because it was Saturday, she was dressed casually. She wore tight jeans with a flouncy hem and a filmy yellow blouse with a feathered fringe. As she tapped her foot, the flouncy hem bounced and her fringe danced. I knew I'd find you here, Violet said. Oh, hi, Violet. Don't, oh, hi, Violet, me. Sergio frowned. He really needed to get back to work. What's wrong? What's wrong? Violet uncrossed her arms and stomped to his desk. She recrossed her arms and looked down at him. Did you buy me a present yet? Sergio pressed his lips together. Oops, he hadn't even thought of it. I've been really busy, Sergio said. Violet snorted. You're not really going to try that, are you? With that ridiculous truck sitting outside? It had to take time to buy that monstrosity. You could manage the time to go to the dealership, and you couldn't pop into a jewelry store and get me a little something? I'm sorry, Violet. I have no excuse. I've just been so wrapped up in the excitement of it all. Wrapped up in yourself, you mean? Is that so bad? What? Being selfish? Yeah, that's bad. Sergio glared at her. If it's selfish to be wrapped up in yourself, then you're kind of the pot calling the kettle black, aren't you? What? What kind of insult is that? You've never heard the idiom, the pot calling the kettle black? Sure, but... She raised her eyebrows. Are you calling me selfish? If the shoe fits. Well, screw you and your stupid idioms. Before Sergio could say anything else, Violet stormed out of his office. For several seconds, Sergio stared after her. Then he shrugged and went back to work. At the end of a very long day, Sergio dragged his tired body to his impressive new truck. He was frustrated. Even if he returned tomorrow and worked all day, he'd still be way behind on Monday morning. At this rate, he was never going to be able to look for a house, much less have time to renovate one. He knew he wasn't home enough these days to really worry about what his home looked like, but he was tired of living under Thunderfeet and tired of living across the hall from Mrs. Bailey. Besides, he deserved to live someplace better than this cubic apartment building with its cheap carpet squares. But how could he move and work? There weren't enough hours in the day. And what was he going to do about Violet? As soon as he changed clothes, Sergio asked Lucky Boy this very question. You deserve to be happy. Lucky Boy said. I agree, Sergio said. But he sat down on the edge of his bed. Violet doesn't make me happy. This was a little bit of a revelation. Huh, Sergio said. He thought back over his year with Violet. Had she ever made him happy? Not exactly. Not really. No, not at all. Having a girlfriend made him feel good. He'd never had one in high school or college. All he'd done was pine for the outer reach Sophia in high school. And in college, he never had time for dating. He'd gone out a few times since then. But Violet was his first steady girl. And that's why he dated her. Not because she made him happy, but because she kept going out with him. Having a steady girlfriend made him feel impressive. What should I do about Violet? Sergio asked Lucky Boy again. If it's broken, fix it or get rid of it. Lucky Boy said. That seemed like good advice. Did Sergio want to fix things with Violet? No, he did not. Okay, then the solution was simple. He leaned over to his nightstand and picked up the phone. He dialed Violet. When she picked up, it was obvious she'd been sleeping. Hello? She breathed into the phone. Violet, I... What time is it, Sergio? Can't you wait until a reasonable time to call and apologize? Sergio rolled his eyes. I'm not calling to apologize. 
I'm calling to break up with you. What? It sounded like you just said, break up with you. That is what I said. I don't want to go out with you anymore. Violet was silent, but she was still on the phone. She could hear her breathing. I should have realized it when I didn't buy you anything. If I loved you and really wanted to be with you, buying you something should have been a no-brainer. But I... Forget you, Sergio, Violet said. You're not good enough for me anyway. You're a funny-looking little man, and I'm too much of a catch for you. Violet slammed down her phone, and the alarm went dead. Sergio sat for a second, to see if he felt bad. He didn't. He looked at Lucky Boy. Great advice. Lucky Boy giggled. Okay, so Sergio's girlfriend problem was solved. But what about his job? How could he be happy and work for the kind of hours he was working? What should I do about my job? Sergio asked Lucky Boy. Better things are on the horizon. Sergio sank down onto his bed. Wow. He never thought. He stared at Lucky Boy, and Lucky Boy's big blue eyes stared back. Why hadn't Sergio thought of that? Why was he still at his job? He hadn't been happy at the firm for some time. And instead of looking for something else, he just applied for the project manager's job. Talk about thinking inside the box. He had to get out of the box. Way out of the box. Sergio stood and started pacing back and forth by his bed. The seed of an idea was sprouting in his mind. What if... He turned and looked at Lucky Boy. What do you think of me starting my own business? You deserve to be your own boss, Lucky Boy said. It would be impressive. Sergio grinned. Yes, it would. He thought about his dad. Even though Tony never said so, he was disappointed in his son's career. Sergio felt it every time Tony asked his stupid skyscraper question. This country runs in the backbone of entrepreneurialism. Tony liked to say, Men like me keep our nation strong. If Sergio wanted to make his dad proud, he needed to be an entrepreneur. And he knew just how to do it. But first, he had to quit his job, which he did the next morning. You're really quitting? Clive said when he walked into Sergio's office 15 minutes after Sergio informed Dale he was done with the new job. What the hell are you playing at? Dale had asked. The top of his bald head turned red as he yelled. You apply for a pivotal job. Get it. Make hash of it. And then you quit. You realize you're done with this firm too, right? Sergio nodded. Well, yes. That was going to be the next thing I told you. I'm quitting entirely. What the hell is wrong with you? Dale shouted. You're our brightest architect. You're throwing your career away. Sergio shrugged. You can think that if you want. I'm going to go into business for myself. Dale guffawed. Oh, that's rich. You'll be homeless in no time. Sergio shrugged again. Nope. I'm going to be a successful, impressive entrepreneur. Dale shook his head and strode out of Sergio's office. Yes, Sergio said to Clive now. I'm really quitting. Clive leaned against the wall and watched Sergio put his personal belongings in a cardboard box. What are you going to do? Get outside the box. Clive laughed and pointed at Sergio's arms, which were both currently inside the box on his desk. Sergio smiled too. You know what I mean. Not exactly, but I wish you luck. Oh, I have a lot of luck now. I have Lucky Boy. He laughed, and he noticed his laugh sounded oddly, a little like Lucky Boy's giggle. Oops. He hadn't meant to say that. Clive frowned. You're Lucky Boy? Is that what you just said? Sergio blinked and lied. Sure. Clive held out a fist, and Sergio bumped it with his. Keep in touch, Clive said. I will, Sergio said. But he didn't. He had too much going on. For one thing, he had to find the right place to renovate into a new home. Sergio thought finding a fixer upper was going to be easy. The town was full of them, and after years of working on residential renovations, he knew plenty of real estate agents. Which one should you call? Sergio sat at his small retro dining room table and ate Kung Pao chicken out of the carton while he pondered his upcoming house hunt. Lucky Boy sat on the table in front of him. 
It occurred to Sergio as he ordered his dinner that leaving the toy in the bedroom was a little discourteous. After all, Lucky Boy had been the catalyst for a lot of great things in Sergio's life, and that was only in a few days. Here Sergio was, a man of leisure, who was about to embark on an impressive entrepreneurial adventure, and was rudely ignoring the little guy who had made it all possible. And so, he brought Lucky Boy out to join him for dinner. I wish I could share this with you, Sergio said to Lucky Boy, but I don't think toys eat. Sergio forked up some of the spicy chicken. He chewed, swallowed, and mused. So, which real estate agent should I pick? Pretty is good, Lucky Boy said. Sergio looked at Lucky Boy. Well, on to a little Casanova. Didn't I just get rid of a girlfriend? Lucky Boy giggled. Are you saying I should find a better one? Lucky Boy giggled again. Okay, Sergio said. Pretty. Let's see. He thought about the agents he knew. One of them, Eve, was very pretty. But he was also reasonably sure she was married. Pretty doesn't do us any good if she's married, he pointed out. You deserve a great girl who doubts on you. Yes, I do. Violet had never doted on him. Good riddance to her. Someone better was out there. He thought for a minute. He snapped his fingers. There was an agent named Claire Fredericks, who was petite and soft-spoken. They once had a conversation about science fiction, and she said she liked it. That was a good start, wasn't it? As far as Sergio knew, she was single. He picked up the phone and called Claire to schedule an appointment to look at houses the next day. Sergio's father would like Claire, Sergio decided, as she sat with her at a conference table in her real estate office. Not only was Claire small and slender, but she was dark-haired too. She looked Italian. He didn't know if she was, but she looked it. That would be good enough for Tony. And he could hear his mother now. Oh, the babies you could make together. She always said that when she tried to set him up with an Italian girl. What exactly did you have in mind? Claire asked, swiveling to face Sergio. Sergio decided that Claire wasn't what most people would call pretty. Her features were a little too strong for that, but he thought she was eye-catching. She had huge, somewhat almond-shaped, very dark brown eyes. He thought of them as comic book eyes. Claire's face would make a great superhero face. This close to her, she could smell her perfume, which was light but distinctive. It smelled like a combination of fruit and flowers, kind of citrusy and kind of sweet. He liked it. He had to force himself to think about houses instead of about Claire. I recently came into a substantial amount of money, Sag told her, and I want to leverage it into not just a new home for me, but a multi-million dollar design business. To that end, I want something that needs a total overhaul. And I'm thinking, something industrial maybe, something with massive architectural potential. Is there anything available in the old warehouse district, the part where that was rezoned? Claire nodded several times. Oh, how exciting. I'd love to be part of helping you build a multi-million dollar business. And I think your plan is excellent. Your design aesthetic is perfect for that kind of building rehab. I didn't know you'd notice my design aesthetic, Sergio said. He blushed. Claire smiled at him. I noticed more than I let on. Sergio smiled back at Claire. He was sure she was flirting with him. Claire cleared her throat. <clears throat> there are several properties that fit your description, but there's one in particular I think will be perfect for you. Do you want to go see it? Absolutely. They went to see it, and it was perfect. The perfect property was an old standalone warehouse that was just at the edge of the area recently rezoned to residential. This meant it got the best of both worlds. It fit with the other warehouse rebuilds around it, but it also backed up to the lush greenery of the neighboring, well-established residential area. At 5,500 square feet, the property was ideal for what Sergio wanted to do with it, which was to make a spacious living area with a lot of architectural wow and an adjoining office space 
with even more eye-catching structural features. The warehouse had a brick exterior that was in fantastic condition, and its interior support beams and load-bearing walls looked sound. Yes, it was an impressive building, and Sergio absolutely deserved it. But it cost more than he'd planned to spend. Sergio did some calculations. He'd already gotten the insurance payout on the car and the refund of the tax and license fees. The truck hadn't cost as much as the sports car, so he was ahead there. If he bought this old warehouse, he was pretty sure he'd have enough left to complete the renovations. Should he go for it? Of course he should. Let's make an offer, Sergio said to Claire. She clapped her hands, then got down to business writing up the offer. I'll go present this right now. I expect the owner to accept it. Do you want to go to dinner to celebrate when he does? Sergio blurted. Claire studied him for a moment. Then she did a cute little half shrug and said, Sure. Sergio grinned. I am so glad I called you. Claire smiled back. Me too. Sergio went home to wait for word on his offer. There, he told Lucky Boy what happened. Lucky Boy giggled. While he waited for Claire's call telling him he got the place, Sergio started making sketches of his ideas for it. He'd already drawn plans for the whole first floor when Claire called. You got it, she said when he answered. Great! I need to wrap up a couple things, and then I'll be free for the evening. Can I pick you up? Sergio asked. Sure. They set a time, and Sergio hung up. He looked at Lucky Boy. Where should I take her to dinner? He asked. I want to impress her. You deserve to go where you want, Lucky Boy said. Impress yourself. Sergio laughed. You're right. I should impress me for a change. Well, I like that Mexican place downtown. The one with the fountain in the courtyard. I'll take her there. Lucky Boy giggled. Sergio played with his plans for a few more minutes, and then he got ready for dinner, putting on a pair of casual black slacks and a grey and black striped dress shirt. He grabbed a black leather jacket to finish off the ensemble, and he started toward the door, only cringing a little when Thunderfeet started a two-step on his ceiling. When he reached the door, his gaze fell on Lucky Boy, who still sat on the table. Sergio felt bad leaving Lucky Boy home alone. He was giving Sergio all this great advice. Did he deserve to sit around like a knick-knack in an empty apartment? No way. Sergio picked up Lucky Boy, tucked him under his arm, and headed out the door. When Sergio glanced at Mrs. Bailey's closed door before he walked down the hall, Lucky Boy giggled. Mrs. Bailey hadn't bothered Sergio since his raisin outburst. He was hoping her hurt feelings, or whatever was keeping her inside her own walls, would hold until he'd moved into his new place. In his lifted truck, Sergio put Lucky Boy in one of the cup holders in the console. When that put Lucky Boy in more of a hole than seemed polite, Sergio dug some paperwork out of the glove box folded it up, and made a sort of elevated seat for Lucky Boy. Lucky Boy giggled. You might not want to do that when Claire's around, Sergio said, starting the engine. Other people's judgments are irrelevant, Lucky Boy said. Sergio glanced at his new friend. You're right, actually. Okay, laugh if you want to. Lucky Boy giggled. Sergio pulled out of his parking garage. Do you think I should take her something? Flowers? Too much or not enough? Roses speak from the heart, Lucky Boy said. Okay, roses it is. Sergio stopped by a florist and bought a dozen pink roses. Judging from Claire's bright eyes and big smile when she spotted them on the dashboard, he made a good choice. She looked from the flowers to Sergio. For me? Of course. He reached out for them and then frowned. What's wrong? Are you allergic? No, no. No. No, I was just thinking they'll wilt while we're at dinner. Sergio shook his head. 
I had them put those little vials of water on the end of each stem. Claire looked at him and smiled widely. Then she hugged him. You're so thoughtful. Sergio accepted the hug and gave Lucky Boy a thumbs up behind Claire's back. As soon as Claire was buckled into a seat, she noticed Lucky Boy. She picked him up. What's this? Sergio tensed, feeling strangely possessive of the little guy. That's Lucky Boy. He's sort of like a mascot. Claire gave him a puzzled look. Sergio hesitated, then decided to go ahead and tell her the whole story. Before, it had seemed wrong to talk about Lucky Boy. But now, it felt disrespectful not to talk about him. Not telling the truth, but like Sergio was taking credit for the recent turn of events his life had taken. Lucky Boy should have some recognition. Sergio told Claire the whole story. Claire listened with rapt attention, her brows going higher and higher as the story went on. When Sergio was done, she turned Lucky Boy over. How does it work? Sergio shrugged. You're not curious? You don't want to take it apart and find out? She saw the tugging on Lucky Boy's arms. Sergio grabbed Lucky Boy away from Claire. No! Claire's eyebrows climbed and much higher. Sorry, Sergio said. I guess I'm sentimental about it. Claire looked from Lucky Boy to Sergio and back. I understand, she said. Sergio didn't think she did, but he didn't say anything else, and by then they'd arrived at the restaurant. The next few weeks passed in a blur. While Sergio was waiting for the deal to close, he finished his designs. Then he submitted them for approval to the city permit offices while he talked to contractors. He was looking for exactly the right team to work on his project, and it didn't take him long to find it. Soon after that, he got approval, and the renovation began. Also, Sergio moved into his new place. He wasn't planning on leaving his old apartment before the renovations to his new place were done, but his lease came up for renewal, and he'd get a penalty if he left before the end of the year. That made no sense, so he let the lease lapse. He hired movers to pack up his stuff and move everything to the new property. So long, Thunderfeet. So long, Mrs. Bailey. Although the warehouse was a mess, filled with piles of demolished wood, concrete, and drywall, a maze of walls stripped of the studs, exposed pipes and wiring, Sergei was able to clear out a corner of it to stack his belongings, store his furniture, and set up his bed. He had electricity and one working bathroom, but he had no kitchen. He bought a small fridge for things like milk and sandwich fixings, but mostly he figured he could eat out or get takeout. It was basically urban camping. Sergio felt like he did when he was a little kid, starting a new adventure. What do you think? He asked Lucky Boy when he set the toy on top of a pile of boxes near the bed. Sergio did his patented moonwalk and spin, and he threw his arms out and up. Isn't this place going to be great? You deserve the best, Lucky Boy said. This will be the best when it's done. Lucky Boy giggled. Sergio once again burned himself having long days, but being his own boss, he didn't mind it so much. He was enjoying overseeing his project, until he wasn't. And he was enjoying Claire, until he wasn't. The problem with the project was money. It turned out that he'd underestimated costs. He didn't have a budget big enough to do all he wanted to do. And if he couldn't do what he wanted to do, he couldn't create an impressive space. If he didn't create an impressive space, he wouldn't be able to use his home as a platform for getting clients. Where can I get more money? Sergio asked Lucky Boy one evening. Rage people have lots of money. Sergio wasn't sure what to make of that, but he figured Lucky Boy would make it clear soon enough. Lucky Boy always told him what to do. By now, Sergio was taking Lucky Boy wherever he went. Lucky Boy helped him all day long. He helped Sergio pick out materials, make design decisions, and manage his time. He even helped Sergio choose his food. Lucky Boy also advised him on other purchases. 
like all of the electronics he was buying for the new place, and all of the casual clothes he was buying to replace his more formal work wardrobe. When Sergei worried about going through his money, Lucky Boy said, You deserve the best! Lucky Boy had the same thing to say about Claire. Everything with Claire was greeted first. She appreciated the places he took her, and the flowers and gifts he bought her. But when money got tighter, and he had to stop giving her gifts and start suggesting they stay at home for takeout, she began changing. Oh, she still acted sweet and all, but he was sure he could sense an undertone in the things she said. Of course, I don't mind having a picnic on the floor of your place. Sounded like, why do you get up making me sit on the floor, cheapskate? It wasn't her words exactly. It was the inflections of her words. And then, there were the ways she was trying to improve him. She went about it in a sneaky way. She wouldn't tell him she didn't like his shirts. For example, she just bought him gifts of new shirts. She didn't tell him she hated his taste in music. She just bought him new CDs. It was becoming annoying. And then there was the helpful suggestions. When he was complaining that he wished he was taller, she said, Well, you could always have lifts put in your shoes, sweetie. Why couldn't she have been supportive and said, Don't be silly, you're punky tall. He was getting tired of coming up short, literally and figuratively. When Sergio asked Lucky Boy about Claire, he said, You deserve the girl of your dreams. Sergio agreed. He needed to stop wasting his time with women who weren't right for him. There was only one girl for him, and that girl was Sophia. He couldn't have her in high school, but things were different now. Not only did he deserve to have her, but she would be lucky to have him. He was going to have to break up with Claire. Unfortunately, a meet the parents dinner was coming up. His mother had been bugging him to set it up for weeks. And the week before, she called, ostensibly to tell him he'd received his third invitation to his tenth high school reunion. But once she had him on the phone, she said, When are we going to get him in your Claire? You keep putting me off, Sergio. It's not nice to put your mother off. Three weeks ago, you said, next week. Two weeks ago, you said, next week. A week ago, I get it, Mama. So? So how about this week? He said, Perfect, his mother said. You'll come on Saturday. Now he wished he hadn't agreed. Should I cancel the dinner? He asked Lucky Boy. Your father is rich, Lucky Boy said. Go to dinner. Get a loan. Sergio had never asked his dad for money. But Lucky Boy was right. Tony was rich. Why not ask for a loan what he went for the dinner? He'd have to break up with Claire after that. As Sergio suspected, his parents liked Claire on sight. His mother fussed over Claire so much, he said, She's not royalty, Mama. Well, I'm just being friendly. His mother patted her graying black hair, which she had twisted into a elaborate bun. She smoothed the full skirt of her emerald green cocktail dress. His mother liked to get dolled up. Claire lifted her chin and said, Sergio, don't you know all women want to be treated like royalty? Fine, Sergio said. Then I'm going to leave you regal ladies here. I need to talk to Papa. Tony had greeted Sergio and Claire and then retreated back into his study. His work wasn't done for the day. But he boomed. Come in! When Sergio knocked on the door, Sergio stepped into his father's domain. As always, he stopped and looked in awe at the space. Tony loved historic architectural details, and he designed an office filled with so many carved wood features and so many filigreed trimmings that it looked like something out of the 16th century. It was a massive office, over a thousand square feet, and it vaulted two stories, lined with bookshelves stuffed with books. The room had a rolling ladder for the tall shelves, and a spiral staircase to an upper balcony. She's a prize, Tony said to Sergio, before motioning Sergio onto a plush maroon leather couch by the brick fireplace. Hmm, Sergio said. Tony lowered himself into his recliner. But you're not here to talk about her. What's on your mind, son? I need a loan, Sergio said. 
he decided to be direct. I thought you won all that money. I've spent nearly all of it. Tony's bushy white eyebrows arose. Papa, you always said you have to spend money to make money. And that's what I'm doing. I have to create a mind-blowing renovation, something so good that it's going to be featured in architectural and design magazines and even the newspaper. I need to create buzz. That's what will get me clients. If you could loan me just a couple hundred thousand, I can create what I want, and then my business will be off and running. I'll pay you back really fast. Tony ran a hand through his curly white hair. He smoothed his mustache, then tapped the side of his long nose. The nose he didn't fortunately hand the dun to Sergio. Okay, Tony said. I'll loan you the money, but it is a short-term loan. If you can't pay it back in six months, you'll pay it back in labor. Sergio, who had been starting to smile, frowned. What do you mean? You'll have to come drive a truck for me. Sergio is stared at his father. Then he shrugged. Why not agree to it? He'd be able to pay back the loan before that would happen. Still, the exchange concerned him. Over dinner, his concerns turned into full-blown annoyance. They had dinner all fresco, sitting at the iron and glass table on the stone patio in the back garden. It would have been a nice meal if Claire hadn't kept sniping at him. Do you want to try some of my roasted Brussels sprouts? She asked him at one point. They're really good. Sergio's mother found the question amusing. Sergio doesn't like Brussels sprouts, Claire dear. He's like his father. They just don't appreciate good vegetables. Tony ignored the comment. Sergio couldn't. It bothered him. Where did Claire get off telling him what he should like? In the car on the way home, Sergio did what he needed to do. Claire was chattering about how lovely his parents' home was. Have you ever thought about designing a big house like that? She asked. Sergio didn't bother to answer the question. He said, I don't want to date you anymore. Claire looked at him. What did you say? You heard me. I don't want to date you anymore. All you do is find fault with me. I don't like it. Find fault? How do I find fault? The shirts? The CDs? What? Giving a gift is finding fault? You told me I should wear lifts. You said you felt short. I was just trying to be helpful. You don't like my taste in vegetables. I was just telling you mine tasted good. I don't know why you'd go out with me if there's so much wrong with me. Sergio complained. Claire crossed her arms and glared at him. You're being ridiculous. Yeah, see? Now you think I'm ridiculous. Claire sighed. You've lost your mind. Riding in the console as always these days, Lucky Boy giggled. Claire picked up Lucky Boy and shook the toy in Sergio's direction. And you play with dolls. Sergio grabbed the Lucky Boy. Put him down. He turned to look at Claire and the truck swerved. Claire held Lucky Boy away from Sergio. You started treating it like a guru, and I was going along with it. But really, Sergio, it's a church keys, a doll, a little statue. It's not your personal guide through life. If you think it is, you're a weirdo. Claire pressed the button to lower her window. You need to get rid of this thing. She raised her arm to toss Lucky Boy out of the truck. Sergio lunged for Lucky Boy, and as he did, he wrenched the wheel. They were heading into a curb and the lifted truck couldn't handle the severe turn. It tipped right over, left the road, and headed down the rocky embankment. Suddenly, they were upside down, then right side up, then upside down. Every flip of the vehicle was accompanied by the screech and crunch of metal against rock. Every jolt threw them around within the confines of their seatbelts, which jerked against their bodies. Thankfully, Sergio was able to get Lucky Boy away from Claire as the truck started going over, so the toy wasn't damaged. The truck landed right side up, but its roof was smashed down toward their heads. Claire started screaming the second the truck stopped moving. Sergei worked as fast as he could to undo his seatbelt and himself. He wanted to get out of the compressed space filled with Claire's hysterical shrieking. He managed to kick his crumpled door open and stumble out. Just as he turned to help Claire, another truck stopped. Are you okay? A middle-aged man called out. Sergio took stock. He got and jostled about, for sure. It felt like he'd pulled a couple muscles, 
and he knew he'd have bruises, but nothing was broken. He looked at Claire. She didn't seem to have anything broken either. He saw no blood. She looked like she was more angry than injured. We're okay, he called out. Speak for yourself, Claire snapped. You're going to pay for this. I'll go get help, the middle-aged man shouted. Sergio called out. Thanks! The truck was a mess. After it was towed, Sergio found out it would need thousands of dollars in bodywork, and it would be in the shop for a couple weeks. Suddenly, Sergio was without a vehicle again. He was also without a girlfriend, and soon he was facing a lawsuit. Claire was suing him for negligence resulting in her injuries. Because Sergio couldn't get to suppliers to choose finishes for his renovation, work started slowing down. On top of that, unbeknownst to Sergio, his contractor had a thing for Claire, and he quit after the accident. I can't in good conscience work for a man who hurts women, the contractor said. That set Sergio's project back a full month, but he wasn't worried. It would all come together. Besides, it wasn't important. He had something far more exciting to think about. The day after Sergio broke up with Claire, he had called his mother to ask if she could get him Sophia's phone number. Before he could ask, though, his mother told him he'd received yet another invitation to his high school reunion. How lucky was that? It would be even better than calling her. He meet up with Sophia at the reunion and wow her and the rest of the class, too. Hey, Mama, he said. You know Sophia Manchester's mama, right? Sophia, that lovely girl from your class. Yes, we're good friends. Could you find out if she's going to the reunion? His mother let out a little squeal. Oh, my Sergio is so clever. Yes, I can do that. That Claire was a nice girl, but Sophia is much better for you. I agree, Mama. Content that the perfect girl was once more in his sights, Sergio returned his attention to his renovations until he heard from his mother. It didn't take long for her to get back to him. When she called him, he was bubbling with enthusiasm. She shouted it in his ear. Sergio, she's definitely coming. Sophia will be at the reunion. Sergio hung up the phone, grinning from ear to ear. Not only was he getting the time he needed to catch up on the renovation, but he was also going to get the girl of his dreams. The next two and a half weeks passed quickly. Sergio didn't make as much progress on the renovation as he wanted, but he wasn't concerned. He finally had his truck back, so things were going to go faster now. You have all the time you need, Lucky Boy told him. He was, however, running out of time to get ready for his reunion. What should I do to get ready for the reunion? Sergio asked Lucky Boy after he polished off a burger one evening. I have the right clothes, but I think I should do more. I want to knock Sophia's socks off. I think I should go above and beyond. What do you think? Sergio was still living pretty much on his bed. The rest of his furniture was stacked up and covered with plastic to keep it free of the paint spatters and dust created by the renovations. He leaned back on his pillow and looked at his little buddy, who now had his own pillow next to Sergio's on the bed. Be the best to get the best. Lucky Boy said, well, Sergio was the best architect, and he was going to have the best business. But what about my looks? Sergio said. I know I'm smart, but smart never counted for much in high school. When I go to the reunion, everyone's going to look at me and see just a ten-year-old version of who I was then. I want to go back looking different, and I have to admit, I do have some flaws in my appearance. My ears, for instance, they're too big. What should I do about my ears? You don't need them, Lucky Boy said. What does that mean? I don't need my ears? Sergey was confused. You're better off without them. Do you think so, really? Sergio asked. Get rid of what you don't need. Sergio nodded. That makes sense. He thought about going to the reunion without his big dopey ears sticking out. That would be so great. But his ears weren't the only issue. I still won't look the way I want to, even without my big ears. I'd really like to look perfect for the reunion. You deserve perfection, 
Lucky Boy said. Exactly! You're right, I do! Sergio leaned over to the box he used as a nightstand. He grabbed a pad of paper and a pen. Okay, Lucky Boy. You need to help me here. Let's figure out what I can do to be the best me for the reunion. Let's make a list so I know exactly what I need to do. Make a plan for perfection! Sergio grinned. That's just what I'm going to do! He tapped the paper with the pen. Okay, well, besides my ears, he said, I hate my hair. He scribbled on the paper. Hair is overrated! Lucky Boy said. Lucky Boy was right. Hair was a lot of work. Dale had a shaved head, and women found him attractive. Sergio made a note, but then he frowned. He remembered Dale talking about how much work it was to maintain a perfectly shaved head. More work, even, than keeping hair nice. Shaving wasn't going to do it. His hair would grow back if he didn't go deep. He scratched out his previous note and wrote a new one. He thought for a few seconds. My eyes are too small. I look like a bird. I have beady eyes. What can I do about my eyes? Eyelids cover eyes! Good point, Sergio said. He made another note. My nose is too long. Cut to fit! That's the rule! Lucky Boy said. Sergio nodded. Of course! When wood was too long, you trimmed off the end. He wrote on the pad. My lips are too thick, Sergio said. They look like a girl's lips. Wood covers are artists, Lucky Boy said. Another good point, Sergio said. Why hadn't he thought of that? He was a master of reshaping wood. He was sure he could reshape anything. He scribbled another note. Then he said, I want to be taller. Remove and reuse, Lucky Boy said. Sergio smiled. Right! He often took scrap material from one part of a project and repurposed it for another part. He made a note. Then he wondered, What should I do about my belly? Lena is Mina, Lucky Boy said. Trim the fat. Sergio nodded and wrote on his list. He smiled warmly at Lucky Boy. You're a great help. I'm so glad I found you. Sergio sat and wrote for a bit longer, and then he stood. Okay, time to get to work. Sergio crossed to the stacks of boxes and moved them around until he found the one he wanted. Tearing off the tape, he reached in and pulled out his kitchen knife set. He put it on the bed, setting the first box aside. He examined the surrounding boxes until he found the next one he wanted. He ripped the tape from that box and pulled out a pair of scissors, needles, and thread, a measuring tape, and some twine. He laid all these items out on the bed. He stepped into the makeshift bathroom area and got his razor. He added that to what he'd already gathered. Then he left his little carved out living space and walked out into the unfinished great room. I should have the rest of what I need out here. He looked around. He spotted a box cutter on what was going to become the kitchen island, and he picked it up. Then he looked around again. His gaze landed on his drill. That would come in handy. Now where had he put his wood carving knives? He had a whole set of them. They were extra sharp for exact contouring. Ah, there they were. He found them tucked behind his router. Pondering it for a moment, he picked it up too, and he grabbed the set of bits and that went with it. He severed this place again. He needed one more thing. He saw what he was looking for on the far side of the room. He crossed over, picked up a handsaw, and returned to his living area. He added his new tools to the collection on the bed. He looked at Lucky Boy. What do you think? Do I have everything? The right tools for the right jobs! Sergei felt a rush of excitement. This was going to be awesome. He was finally going to fix himself up, so he'd be as eye-catching as he was successful. Sergio did a moonwalk along the foot of the bed. He spun in a circle and looked at his assembled tools. Where to begin? Sergio's class reunion was being held in the Grand Ballroom of the oldest hotel in town. He was excited about that because the ballroom was impressive. With gilded ornate ceilings and carved panel walls, Filled with crystal chandeliers and fine artwork, the room was exactly the kind of room that would make a great backdrop for Sergio's new and impressive look. 
He was going to drop some jaws this evening. That was for sure. He decided to arrive late, so he had the biggest audience possible for his grand entrance. Thankful to have his big truck to get into the festivities, Sergio drove up to the hotel in gleeful anticipation. This was going to be so much fun. Inside the hotel, most of Sergio's classmates were already in full party mode. Squealed greetings, warm hugs, and fun laughter joined in with the 80s rock hits played by a raucous band. Even though the room was already fancy, the reunion planners had topped off the room with streamers and a big Welcome Class of 85 banner that hung high on the wall. Reunion attendees talked and joked and danced under a floating cloud of helium balloons. When the ballroom doors opened to let in the latest arrival, all eyes turned to see who was coming in now. In unison, all those eyes widened in horror. The music stopped playing with the screech of a discordant guitar chord and the reverberating clash of a cymbal. Talking ceased entirely. The entire room went completely silent. Then a woman screamed. And another. And another. One woman fainted. Someone threw up. Several people covered their mouths. Several more turned away. Some started running toward the back of the room. Not sure what was causing the upset, Sergio looked behind him to see if something terrible was coming. He saw nothing. A man and a woman were at the far end of the hall, but they were headed the other way. A waiter was coming out of another ballroom, but he, too, was going in the other direction. No one was behind Sergio. As Sergio started to turn back toward his classmates, his gaze landed on the floor. He frowned. The floor was disgusting. What had happened in this hallway? Sergio hadn't noticed the floor when he walked in probably because he was so eager to make his captivating appearance. But now, he said at it. The gold carpet behind him was stained with a thick trail of blood. No, not just blood. White bits of flesh nestled in the blood. He also saw what looked like bone bits, clumps of hair, and blobs of what appeared to be pink spongy tissue dropped at intervals along the center of the hallway. The blobs gleamed in the glow from the overhead chandeliers and seemed to wiggle as he looked at them. It was nauseating. Sergio was appalled. He thought this was supposed to be a classy hotel. Someone should do something about the mess. But if he went to get a hotel employee now, he'd mess up his timing. His classmates were waiting for him. Sergio looked back down the hall to where he'd left Lucky Boy sitting on a chair so he could watch Sergio's triumph. Lucky Boy would agree that Sergio deserved to have the best cleaners take care of his mess. Lucky Boy giggled. Sergio looked down at his feet and noticed even more gruesome waste staining the carpet next to his brand new shoes. Oh, for heaven's sake. Some of the gore had even gotten on the black leather. He leaned over and wiped off what looked to be some rubbery gristle. He shook his head. He would deal with the hotel's janitorial shortcomings later. He turned back to his fellow classmates. Now, he said to himself, where is Sophia? And that is the end of story two. Thank you for listening to this read-through of Five Nights at Freddy's, Fazbear Frights number eight, story two, Sergio's Lucky Day. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did, please hit that like button. And if you're new to this channel, why not subscribe to get the next story of this read-through novel. Also, make sure you click that bell icon so you'll be notified the next time I post a story. And I'll be back next time with the next story.